One of the things that I love about hosting Insight Laramie is that I get to make, meet people that I've never met before and who are clearly awesome. And one such person is our next presenter, John Poland, who I just met on Sunday afternoon. John works at the Ark in town, where he is a client services manager, providing service for adults with intellectual disabilities. John loves the relationships he's built there. The relationships with individuals and the community make Laramie feel like a second home to John. His first home was New York, where he was born. He's also lived in Ohio and South Carolina. And he's been in Laramie since 2015, when he arrived here to begin studying for an MA in philosophy, which he has now achieved. John is a founding member of Laramie's premier acoustic Black Sabbath cover band. Um, <laughs> He admitted that they're also the only acoustic Black Sabbath cover band in Laramie, but they're still premier. So any other acoustic Black Sabbath cover bands out there, don't get any ideas. Uh, John's greatest fear in life is heights. And when I asked him what he's most confident that he can handle in life, he had no doubt. He's like, if there was a pizza place in town that did a pizza eating challenge, I could win against anyone. So hopefully the manager from Papa John's is in the audience tonight and can get us, can get us hooked up. Reflecting on himself as a storyteller, John says he enjoys the entertainment aspect of storytelling. He likes getting people jazzed up with the story of something that excites him, which is usually the question of intellectual struggle, which is also the topic of his talk today. How do we know what we know? So please welcome John Poland for his presentation, Science, Pseudoscience, and Monsters of the Mind. Thank you all. Thank you, Peter. And I do have the market cornered on Black Sabbath music in Laramie, so don't hedge in on it. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks. Uh, some monsters exist only in our minds. It's not to say that these monsters are merely imaginative, like the monster under your bed up there that keep you awake at night and still keep me awake at night. The monsters I'm talking about have more definition, fuller form, and command our attention a little bit longer or maybe sometimes much longer. They also don't exist merely as concepts without a real-world referent. Abominable snowmen are a familiar example of such a monster. Having these monsters in your mind uh, will lead people to do extraordinary things to find evidence for their worldly existence. And sometimes if the evidence is available, you just make it up. The monsters that I'm talking about exist as problems to solve. And people concentrate on these problems and dedicate decades of their lives, uh, maybe a whole lifetime, in pursuit of uh, solutions with no guarantee of success. And uh, Albert Einstein, I believe, faced one of these problems when he was uh, imagining what it would be like to chase a beam of light. Well, in 1928, Karl Popper was a young psychologist in training, and he began grappling with his own, uh, what would become a monster of his mind. And as the hackneyed saying goes, uh, be careful when you are out hunting monsters, right, lest you become one yourself. So, by most accounts, Papa was not a humble man. He was meticulous, hardworking, quick to take offense to criticism, and per perhaps overly critical of the work of others. His personality might terribly be described as tolerably irascible, if you're able to view him in light of his genius. But... It was an effort for everybody to view him in light of his genius, apparently. In 1946, uh, a 10-minute disagreement between Popper and uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who was probably one of the most brilliant philosophers of the time, uh, legendarily concluded with Wittgenstein threatening Popper with a red-hot fire poker that uh, turned out to be a humorously ironic meeting of the Cambridge Moral Science Club. And um, so there are still d d disputes about what exactly happened at that meeting, but no doubt Wittgenstein and Popper had words for sure and a fire poker was involved. But there's a whole book written on that that you can check out. We'll get back to my story about monsters. Um, at the time uh, Popper was studying, Vienna was a very popular place uh, an intellectual cultural center. And lots of people were developing new approaches to uh, sci psychology. And part of Popper's work was to um, try to unify these approaches and see what, you know, you separate the wheat from the chaff and how can you do these types of things. And that led him head on into his monster of the mind, uh, which is known as the demarcation problem. Simply put, the demarcation problem is where do we put the line that uh, distinguishes science from pseudoscience or non-science? Uh, most of us can agree that 
Facts about yetis belong on one side of the line. Facts about general relativity belong on the other side of the line. But uh, articulating why that is uh, can make a mess out of our intuitions and our beliefs. So in his first book, uh, Popper offers a simple, concise answer to this problem. Falsifiability. Scientific theories are those that are falsifiable, and non-scientific theories are ones that can't be falsified. And to be falsifiable is just that it can be refuted by means of a test or observation. Three different theories kind of contributed to his thinking on this subject. Uh, the first one is uh, Marx's theory of history, then Freud's psychoanalytic theories, and finally Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, uh, which was the one that he considered scientific and the other two unscientific. The three theories are different ways of accommodating confounding data uh, gave um, Popper his insight uh, was that Einstein's theory made like really big bold predictions like the way light would bend to what degree when passing around a massive object like a star or a planet. And these observations, uh, these predictions were observed and so if they hadn't been observed then the theory would have been refuted on Popper's view. Now, Marx and Freud don't bet big like that. Um, on the one hand, uh, he thinks Freud's uh, psychoanalytic theories are just, in principle, unfalsifiable. So any data can be accounted by the theory, and there's no risk there. Um, Any time that uh, you would make a big risk like in Einstein's theory, Freud is backing it off and having a, almost a risk-free theory. And Marx's theory receives a slightly different treatment, but classified as pseudoscience nonetheless. Uh, this is because when confronted with evidence that seems to falsify uh, the theory, Marxists make special claims just to avoid such falsification. So if the communist revolution is supposed to come about predicted by the theory, but it doesn't happen, it's not because the theory is wrong, right? Perhaps the uh, people in power created a welfare state which sated the uh, appetite for revolution for a little bit. And as you keep adding these type of ad hoc uh, hypotheses on there, uh, Popper says that this is being adhered to dogmatically or uncritically. And so he comes to believe that falsifiability is the line we can make it. And here's where we need to remember the insightful warning at the beginning of the talk about hunting monsters. Popper's criteria of falsifiability, if it's true, is great. It puts science on a rational foundation. Um, you know, there's no worries of skepticism that arise from these things, and uh, scientific consensus is not a matter of um, uh, uh, arbitrariness. But are things really that simple ever to have one thing that will uh, make complex social interactions to one side or the other? It was known to Popper at the time that real working scientists didn't operate like it, as his theory described, right? They didn't just drop a theory uh, at the hint of any falsifying evidence. Rather, they tweak a theory here and there, trying to adjust it to accommodate things. But such tweaking was the same kind of adjustments that he derided in the Marxist theorists. And so in order to account for the tweaking of practical scientists, he had to tweak his theory. And he would tweak it in favor of you know, the, 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 the theories that seem scientific and then the tweaks that were not scientific, like the Marxists, he would put to the other side. And so, uh, as his tweaking came about, it seemed that it was a little ungenerous to other theorists out there. And it ends up looking that Popper, like towards the end of his life, is keeps, uh, <laughs> he keeps on uh, defending his single criteria for a long time uh, to the point where maybe it makes you consider or wonder, did he end up um, f falling victim to the, to the monster that he was trying to slay there? Thank you very much.